A Bizarre Witch. A long time ago, King Arthur of England was hunting in the Forbidden Kingdom, but the kingdom's soldiers found him. Stop! You are not allowed to hunt in the Forbidden Kingdom. That's why we call it Forbidden. Who gave you permission to be here? Nobody. Then you come with us. We will take you to King Marcus, the king of the Forbidden Kingdom. When King Marcus saw him, he said, "You look like a smart guy, but the penalty for entering the Forbidden Kingdom is amputation of limb." Okay. Uh, wait, what? Amputation? I didn't even see a no trespassing sign. Actually, he was trespassing and hunting, my king. Oh, I see. In that case, the penalty is death. You seem like a nice guy, and you look pretty good with your limbs. So, I will forgive you on one condition. Um. <clears throat> okay. What do you want? Go back to your kingdom, and I will give you one year to find out the answer to a very difficult question. Oh. <sighs> Okay, no problem. I have a think tank university back at my castle. They solve all types of questions. So, do you want to know the question? Yes, I do. Wait. Uh, okay. Yes, I'm ready. The question is, what do women want? Who? Oh. Uh. Hmm. Wow. Maybe we could revisit the left arm idea. You have one year. Then we take your arm. Then we take your life. That's an impossible question to answer. Not even the wisest man in my kingdom would have an answer to your question. But I guess it's worth a try. See you in a year. You are free to go, and don't forget, I'll be waiting for you. King Arthur returned to his kingdom and started questioning everybody. The princess, the queen, the priests, the wise men, but no one had an answer. Then, he asked one of his maids. Well, people say there's a witch living in the deep forest who knows the answer to any question. Why don't you go and ask her? Whoa, that's weird. Why would a witch know? I really don't know. But she's a woman, and you seem to have asked everyone else in the kingdom. So maybe it's worth a try. What does she charge? Less than a limb? Ah,、uh, a limb? Probably less. Kind of hard to tell with inflation and currency exchange. Well, if she has the answer, then I gotta have it. I like my limbs. Just don't go alone. Take your soldiers with you. She's not a very pleasant person. Ah, uh, I will. Thanks for the advice. That same night, King Arthur went to the old witch's house. And just as he was about to knock, the witch opened the door. I've been expecting you. I know that your time is running out. Oh well, if you already know why I'm here, then just tell me the answer. Are you willing to pay the price? Name your price. I just gotta do what I gotta do. So you would accept the deal? Uh, yeah, sure. Then it's a deal. I want to marry Sir Gwen, your best friend. Are you out of your mind? Makes me sick just to think of the idea of you marrying him. You accepted the price, don't you remember? Have you seen yourself in a mirror? You're ugly.、Uh, you only have one tooth, and you're hunchbacked. You're the most repulsive person I've ever seen. How can I ask my best friend to sacrifice because of me? Talk to him. I know that you will come back. King Arthur had no choice but to talk to his friend. It is okay, my king. Marrying such an ugly witch is worth it to save your limbs. Ah,、oh, thank you so much, Gwen. <laughs> I guess I should call you my right-hand man since you're saving my limb and all. Tell her I accept and prepare everything. The wedding shall be tomorrow. You'll cover the bill, right? King Arthur returned to the witch's house. I will be ready tomorrow after the wedding. You will have your answer. When the wedding papers were signed, the witch said, "What a lady wants is to be valued." Everybody at the wedding was astonished that King Arthur had made such a deal, even the women. But they hoped that King Arthur would now be safe from King Marcus, 
and King Arthur made plans to travel to the Forbidden Kingdom to deliver his answer. Meanwhile, at the wedding, Gwen was respectful and kind to the witch. But the guests, who were noblemen and maidens, had their own opinions. Look at the way she eats. I feel ashamed just to look at her. Why does she have to eat with her bare hands? If we have spoons, are you listening to the noise she makes when she eats, or is it just my imagination? Poor Gwen, he's so handsome. He's truly a good friend. Indeed, he is. Later that night, Gwen was alone in his room when the door opened, and he saw a beautiful young lady. Who, 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 who are you? I am your wife. My wife? Well, what kind of joke is this? It's not a joke. It is me. Long ago, people's cruel words cursed me to appear ugly and repulsive. But your kindness has revealed my beauty again. But you're gorgeous. What's happened to you? You treated me with kindness and showed me that I was valuable and protected. So half of the time I will look horrible, and the other half I will be beautiful, as you see me right now. Huh? <gasps> wow. I'm speechless. Is there any way you could just be beautiful all the time? No, you must decide which half of the day I am beautiful, and which half I will be ugly. Shall I be beautiful in public, or beautiful when I am with you alone? Hmm. Let me think. I'll let you know my decision in a few hours. Call me when you are ready. I will. When the witch left the room, Gwen went on to the garden near the castle just to think about what to do. What should I do? What should I do? I should surely want an adorable young lady during the day for everybody else to see, especially my friends. At night, I would like a beautiful girl and not a horrible witch. Or should I prefer the opposite? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. After a few minutes, Gwen made a decision, went back to the castle, and straight to his room. Where his wife was already waiting. What is your answer, Milady? I cannot decide. The people at our wedding said so many unkind things about you. I wish I could teach them a lesson and show up during the daytime with a gorgeous bride at my side. But then again, I don't need their approval about who I should love. I don't care what they say. But I do care about what they say about you, though. So perhaps it is best if you could be beautiful in public, so they won't hurt your feelings. But then I will appear to be ugly when I am alone with you. Yes, but that will not stop me from loving you, my wife. I will be content knowing that others can see your outward beauty, and I know you are beautiful on the inside. Oh, Gwen, I was hoping you would say that. The curse upon me will now be completely gone, because you have chosen to love me and value me, whether I am beautiful or not, and that you would rather give up your own happiness to protect me, than to see me come to harm. Now I will be beautiful for you all the time. And they lived happily ever after. And the king got to keep his arm. He was happy about that too. The end. The magic porridge pot. Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. 
<laughs> While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, "What happened, my child? Why are you crying?" And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry," said Melody with grief on her face. "Don't worry," the fairy said, and with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice. To which the fairy answered, "This is a magical pot." When you want something to eat, say "cook pot cook," and when it's ready, say "stop pot stop." <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy, and with due respect, she asked the fairy, "Oh, dear fairy godmother, I don't have enough words to thank you." Please tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return, but if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother. Was very unhappy, and said, "What use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it?" Melody lifted the pot to the table, and simply said, "Cook pot, cook." Nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. The steam rose, and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> Yummy. that she could mm. not resist the mm. creamy mm. porridge,、oh, and、delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot! Stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, "Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy." So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy、Ta-ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again.、Toodles. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away、Bye-bye. to make space、See、for you the later. new one. See you later, or not? She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook pot, cook. She commanded, and presto! From inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear! How did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. 
Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End If you enjoyed this story, please like and subscribe our channel and press the bell icon to get future updates. And don't forget to comment! The Enchanted Princess Once upon a time, there was an old farmer who had two sons, Austin and Carter. Carter! Where are you? I need your help. Don't bother me, old man. I'm taking a nap. <sighs> Austin, keep working on that fence while I go to town. Yes, father. While the man was going to town, he thought, I have to do something before we go broke. I've got to sit down and figure this out. He sat down beneath the tree. Two people were sitting beside him, and he heard their conversation. The king's daughter is locked up in a castle, guarded by a dragon and an old lady. The man who wishes to rescue the princess has to overcome three tests. People say they are very hard tests, don't they? And those that don't pass the tests are eaten by the dragon. And if someone happens to pass those three tests, that man will marry the princess and own the castle and its treasure. Then the farmer thought, Oh, Carter will do it. He will pass those three tests and then marry the princess, and he will be king. A few days later, the farmer gave his only horse and his only sword to Carter to go and rescue the princess. Carter carelessly hit things with his sword along the way. The boy had a cruel heart. When he passed by an ant nest, he destroyed it. When he drank water from a lake, he threw rocks at the little ducks there. And as he neared the castle, he saw a beehive and hit it with his sword. He ran off and finally got to the castle. He kicked on the door and started shouting. Uh, hey, you! Uh, open this door immediately! Uh, so tired. How dare you! Don't make me wait or I'll break it down! Finally, an old lady with a sweet voice opened the door. Who's knocking? I've been here almost an hour. Are you deaf? Oh no, I'm not deaf. I have to rescue the princess. I, I have to be king. Wait, wait. First, you will need to go through three tests. Tests? What, what are the tests? I'm not afraid of anything. I will throw these sunflower seeds into the air. They will be blown by the wind and you will have to pick them up and put them inside this bag in only one hour. You think I'm crazy? What kind of test is this? I will be back in an hour. <laughs>
and the old lady threw the seeds into the air and then closed the door. Ah, oh, this is impossible. I won't pick up all these seeds. When the old lady returned, she told him of the second test. She threw twelve golden rings into a deep lake. You have to pick them up in an hour. I'm not crazy. The water is deep and cold. <laughs> you are not doing it very well, my dear. But let's do the third test. Follow me. <sighs> I'm getting bored. Inside, they arrived to the castle. They went to a dark room. There are three silhouettes covered with white sheets. You have one hour to tell me which one is the princess. If your guess is right, she will be free. But if not... I choose the one on the right. The one on the right. Uncover yourself. No, oh, no, no! A dragon! No, 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 no! <laughs> A few days later, the farmer was talking to Austin. Where's Carter? I feel worried for him. Father, let me go to the castle. No, son. I don't want to lose my only son now. Trust me, father. I will be back. But I don't have a horse. And I don't have a sword to give you. Austin only took a piece of bread and went on foot to the enchanted castle. He decided to rest under a tree. There he saw an ant nest, and many ants were trying to rebuild it. Oh, you poor ants. Who destroyed your nest? I will help you to rebuild. When he finished, he walked to a lake to drink some water. There he saw some little ducks swimming. Oh, you poor fuzzy ducks. You must be hungry. Here, take my only piece of bread. The little ducks ate the bread. Then he saw a beehive on the ground. He picked it up and put it up in the tree, and he continued his journey to the enchanted castle. When he arrived, he knocked at the door. What do you want, my dear? Hello. I would like to rescue the princess. You can try. The old lady spread on the ground sunflower seeds and left. Hmm strange lack of direction, but I think I'll clean these up. Forty-five minutes later, Austin was about to give up. Then the ants came to help him. They were grateful because he helped them rebuild their ant nest. Wow, you came marching one by one. Thank you, my good friends. The bag is full of seeds again. Then the old lady came back. Well, that's surprising. A full bag of seeds. Well, now you have to go through the second test. Here, you have to catch these twelve rings. The old lady threw the rings into the water. Austin dove into the water, but it was too deep, and he couldn't catch any of the rings before they sunk to the bottom of the lake. But then he saw something moving inside the water. They were the ducks, who came to help him because he shared with them a little piece of bread. Oh, thank you, my good friends. Now I have all twelve rings. He went straight to see the old lady. Huh, all twelve rings. That's never happened before. No matter. Follow me. The old lady explained to Austin about the third test. When he was looking at three silhouettes, he couldn't figure out which one was the princess. Hmm, they all look the same. Think, Austin. Think. Which one is the princess? Suddenly, hundreds of bees entered through the window and flew around the middle silhouette. It's the middle one. Oh, the one in the middle. Uncover it yourself. The white sheet fell to the ground and the princess appeared. Thank you, Austin, for solving the riddles and rescuing me. The princess inexplicably said. Then they saw the dragon escaping from the tower. Now you are the master of this castle. I'll leave now. So when Austin had dried off, he asked the princess to marry him. 
And shockingly, she said yes. And they all lived happily ever after, building beehives and filling the castle's moat with adorable fluffy ducklings. The End The Little Match Girl It was a bitterly cold evening. Flurries of snow filled the sky and covered the darkening village below this New Year's Eve. Oh, my sweet little child, I am so sorry I have to send you out into the frozen darkness to sell these matches this evening. But, as you can see, I cannot walk because I'm sick. Yes, Grandma. I understand. And remember, sweetheart, with the money you make from selling these matches, we can eat tonight. Otherwise, we will be forced to try and sleep with our stomachs empty. Now go, my child. Don't worry, Grandma. I will sell all the matches and we'll be sure to bring home lots of food as well. Goodbye. In this chilling darkness, there whisked along the cobbled stone streets a poor little girl who was nearly eight years old and an orphan. She had to cap to warm her head, and her clothes were all threadbare and nearly worn through in places. She walked with calloused and wounded bare feet, for she had no shoes. She stood on the corner, clinging hopefully to the matchboxes which she held in her thin, bare hands. People bustled all about her, busy with Christmas shopping, not even giving a glance to the poor little child. Sweetie, do you like what I bought you in that toy store? Oh yes, Mother. The doll is pretty. Thank you. And the dress is so lovely. The little match girl's eyes filled with tears. But there was no time to cry, for she must sell some matches so she and her grandmother can have dinner that evening. So she bravely wiped the grief from her eyes and said to the woman, Lady, would you like to buy some matches, please? They're very sturdy and nice. No, I don't need matches. Get away from my daughter. I don't know why they let these kinds of people on streets to mingle among decent people such as ourselves. Look at her dress, Mother. It's so old. I'm sorry, but these are the only clothes I have. It's not my problem. And besides, I don't have money. Even if I did, I wouldn't buy matches. So get away and leave us alone. But... They're only one penny each. Don't you understand? I don't want it. Now go away, or I will call the police. The little match girl trembles. Snow begins to fall. Once more, as she presses on with her quest to try and sell matches to people passing by. Ma'am, please, would you like to buy some matches? They're magical, you know. When you light one, all your wishes will, will come true. That's nonsense. Those are fairy tales. But ma'am, please buy at least one. Its light will give you the most wonderful Christmas. I told you. No, I don't need one. It is true. Each one is different. I don't want matches today. Why don't you go home? It's a cold night. I can't, ma'am. I don't have parents. And my grandma is very sick. I don't have any money left to buy medicine or food for her. I do wish I could help you, my dear. But I do not have enough money to spare. Maybe somebody else will buy some from you. Maybe. Maybe. The little match girl's spirits began to sink 
as the cold winds became stronger and swirled round about her frail form, seeming to snatch at her with its icy claws. With a final blast of determination, the little match girl continued to offer her wares, but to no avail. Finally, feeling alone and defeated, she slumps down upon the sidewalk, shivering uncontrollably from the cold. My hands and feet feel like blocks of ice. I will light one of my trusty matches just to warm my fingers a little. The poor little match girl's hands were shivering so greatly that she was unable to light a match. After some time and great effort, she lights up one single match. And to her surprise, the matchstick transformed into an iron stove, and the little girl soon began to feel warm. She put her tiny icicle-like fingers closer to the stove. She was very happy. But a few moments later, a snowflake dropped right on her matchstick and snuffed it out. So she stood up and once again tried to sell her matches. Alas, not a single match had been sold thus far. Suddenly, she heard a voice. Hi there, little girl. What do you have there to sell? I sell matches. Would you like to buy one? As soon as she turned towards the voice, she sees an old homeless woman standing in a corner with her skinny dog. They both are shivering with cold. Don't you see that I am as poor as you? Oh, sorry. I have to sell these matches to get some food for my grandma. Poor girl. Well, will you please take care of my dog for me? It will only be here for a little while. I must go and find some food. Perhaps I can bring some food for you too. Well, at least I can get some food for my grandma. But please come soon, as I have to get her medicine too. The little match girl agreed to watch after the dog, and the old woman left with a promise to return as quickly as she could. She held the dog's leash as he sat quietly on the corner. In a while, the poor girl started shivering again. She thought for a moment and took out the matchbox and burnt it against the wall. To her surprise, she sees a table full of wonderful things to eat, with turkey, lamb, goose, fish, apples, and cakes. Oh, I wish I could eat it all. I feel so peaceful in this place. As soon as she reached for a piece of cake, the flame of the matchstick went out and everything vanished. She was very disappointed. She looked up towards the sky and prayed. Oh, Lord, please take me out of this sadness. I'm so hungry and miserable. Please help me. Just then, she saw a star falling from the heavens, and she recalled something that her grandma had told her. Grandma says when a star falls, someone dies. My grandma is very sick. Does it mean that I lost my grandma? <gasps> oh, she loved me more than anyone else in the whole world. She took out another matchstick and lit it. She was surprised to see her grandmother standing in front of her. Oh, Grandma! Is that you? Yes, child. I am here for you. The little match girl was pleased to see her grandma, but was rather alarmed, for she could see that her grandma was floating in the air. Don't be afraid, my child. I 
am safe and well now. You don't have to worry about me anymore. The little match girl opens her mouth to tell her grandma how hard she tried to sell the matchsticks. Then the flame of the matchstick went out once again, and her grandma disappeared. This time, the poor child lights all of her matchsticks at once, as she didn't want her grandma to disappear again. And the glow was so bright, it was as sunlight. Her grandma reappears and gazed lovingly at the little match girl, smiling. Grandma, I'm so scared. I don't want to stay here anymore. Please take me with you. Yes, dear. I will take you with me. Give me your hand. Grandmother took the little match girl's hand, then lifted her in her arms. They both started soaring upward to the sky. How are you feeling now, my sweet angel? Oh, Grandma, now I feel wonderful. I don't feel hungry or cold anymore. I feel as light as a feather. Grandma smiled again, and they both flew to heaven. And in that same moment, a little star fell from the sky. The next day, when the sun was rising up again, the little match girl was sitting on the ground with all the burnt matches in her hand, and a contented smile resting on her face. Many people looked on at the little match girl lying lifeless upon the sidewalk. They all grieved for the loss of the bright light that her life was to them. The End The Elves and the Shoemaker There was once a shoemaker who worked very hard and made very good shoes. But still, he could not earn enough to make his living. At last, all his money ran out and he had only enough leather left to make one more pair of shoes. That evening, he cut out the leather, ready to be stitched up the following morning. And then he followed his wife upstairs to bed, feeling very sad. He rose again at sunrise, said his prayers, and was about to settle down to work, when to his amazement, he saw the shoes all stitched up and ready on the table. The good man could not understand how it had happened. He examined the shoes carefully and found that they were quite beautifully stitched and finished off. The same day, a customer came into the shop and bought the shoes. And because they were of such excellent quality, he was willing to pay the double the usual price for them. With this money, the cobbler had bought enough leather for two more pairs of shoes. Again he cut them out and again he left the leather on his bench overnight thinking he would stitch them together the following morning. But when he awoke, he found that the work had already been done for him. The two pairs of shoes were as beautifully made as the first and soon found willing buyers. And the shoemaker received enough money for them to buy leather for four more pairs. Soon it went on for weeks and months. Each evening, the shoemaker would carefully cut out the leather, say his prayers and retire to bed. And each morning, he would find the shoes standing soon and ready in neat rows on the bench. Eight pairs at first, then twelve, then twenty and almost too many pairs to count. And he had so many customers that now he could afford to buy the finest skins and other costly materials besides. He cut out knee-high boots of the softest suit for the lords to wear when they rode off with their hounds to the hunt, and shoes of silk and brocade and velvet for the ladies to wear with their fashionable ball gowns. And before many months had passed, the shoemaker grew so rich that he began to want to share his prosperity with his invisible helpers. One night, he and his wife hid behind a pile of leather hides to see who these helpers were. At midnight, 
two little naked men appeared and hey presto they stitched up all the shoemaker's shoes for him then they disappeared the shoemaker's wife was very sorry for them because of their nakedness and she at once set to work to sew them the loveliest little clothes while the shoemaker made them a pair of pointed silk shoes they laid the present out and were on the watch again at midnight as the little men came in to do their work when the elves saw their clothes they were delighted they put them on and laughed and danced all around the room and they skipped out into the street never to be seen again but the shoemaker continued to be successful and prosperous in his work for the rest of his days good deeds always pay 100 years ago in rome there used to live a slave his name was andro clege his boss was very cruel he used to give his slave lots of work like cutting wood getting water working all the time if he made any mistake then his boss would beat him up a lot one day he was beaten for some small mistake he made he was beaten so much he started crying and then he ran away his boss could not figure out where he had run off to after a while he reached a jungle and for some days he lived in a cave he used to go out in the daytime to eat fruit and drink water from the river this was his new life and that is how many days passed one day he came out of the cave to gather some fruit as soon as he was back in his cave he found someone there he found out it was a lion that lion was in so much pain he could only use one of his legs and he seemed to be hurting so very much When the slave looked closely, he found that a thorn had gotten stuck in the poor lion's leg. He got close to the lion. He took the lion's leg in his hand and very slowly pulled out the thorn. He used some bandages. Now the lion was feeling better. After 2 or 3 days, the lion's leg healed. Then one day, the lion left the cave. Andro felt very good. Many days had passed and he became bored. He was wondering what he should do. Where should he go? So, he decided to visit a different city. So he left the cave and reached a city. But his bad luck was following him. That very same day, His cruel master had also come to the city. As soon as he saw Andro, he shouted to nearby soldiers to arrest him. His army men put Andro in jail. That time in Rome, there was a rule that captivated criminals are fed to the lions. For a couple of days, he was in prison, and after some time, he was put in front of a lion there were so many people to see including the king of rome then the cage was opened and andro had one tiny knife with him to protect himself against the lion when the lion saw andro it roared very loudly It was about to attack Andro when suddenly the roaring lion realized that he had seen this man somewhere when it looked closely it realized that this was the same man who helped him the lion bowed in front of Andro and started licking Andro's feet the people were astonished and so was the king Actually, Andro was also astonished that instead of getting eaten, why this lion was licking his feet. When he looked closely, Andro realized that this 
was the same lion that he had helped once. He sat down and started to pet him. The king did not understand. What was he supposed to do now? He asked his guards to get the lion back in the cage and bring that slave to me. They brought the slave to the king. The king asked him, How is it that the lion did not kill or eat you? Then Andro told the king that a couple of weeks ago, he had pulled a thorn out of the foot of the lion. And that is why the lion didn't kill him. The king asked him, Why weren't you scared while you were helping the lion? Then Andrew said, Why would I be afraid? This lion can't be as mean as my master was. After listening to this, the king was so touched and he appreciated Andro that the king declared from now on Andro would no longer be anyone's slave. Andro received a large reward and then his cruel master was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison. So my friends, the moral of the story is treat others as you would want to be treated, with kindness and helpfulness. Long time ago, a woodcutter lived in a tiny cottage next to a deep forest with his two children, Hansel and Gretel. Hansel was a smart and clever boy and Gretel was a shy and timid girl. His second wife often ill-treated the children and was forever nagging the woodcutter. There is not enough food in the house for us all. There are too many mouths to feed. We must get rid of the two brats or we will all starve to death. She declared. The woodcutter opposed the wife's evil plan, but she wouldn't listen to him. Poor Hansel and Gretel had overheard the conversation and were left crying all night. One day, father had to go to the town to earn money for the family's living. The evil stepmother got a chance to take little children in the forest and leave them all by themselves. Next morning, the stepmother calls out for Hansel and Gretel and says cheerfully, Get ready, my children. Let's go for a picnic. She tries to be as kind as possible so that the children do not come to know of her plans. She packs a bag with some bread and cookies and hands it over to Gretel and says, Hold the sweet little Gretel. We shall have this food in the forest. She merrily locks the house and they start walking towards the forest. Hansel was a stone collector. He had a huge collection of white pebbles which he carried everywhere. Stealthily, Hansel laid a trail of white pebbles thinking. Mm, we can follow these pebbles back home. For him, it was just a part of a game. He was unaware of his stepmother's plan. But she noticed the white pebbles that Hansel was dropping by, but she remained quiet. As they reached deep in the forest, the stepmother said, This looks like a good spot for picnic. You both can take a nap here while I go and get some fresh fruits for you too. She left them all alone. Hansel and Gretel sat below a big tree and ate some cookies and played some games. Time passed by and it was almost evening. Gretel started to get worried that their mother was not back yet to get them. Since the stepmother had seen Hansel dropping the pebbles all the way till where she left them, she knew the children were smart enough to follow the pebbles back home. So. On her way back, she collected the white pebbles that Hansel had dropped and made a similar trail of the pebbles towards an unused path which lay elsewhere. Gretel was scared, so Hansel told her, 
Let's wait for the nightfall. I dropped a trail of white pebbles all the way here. So with the moonlight shining on them, we could get back home. When the night fell, the horrible sound of all the wild animals started to echo around them. They were scared, but they waited till the moon rise and they were happy to see their white pebbles shining in the moonlight and started to follow the trail which they thought they had laid cleverly unaware that the stepmother had changed the path. Now give me your hand. We'll get back home safely. You'll see. Hansel said with immense confidence. Soon they were tired of walking and they were nowhere close to their house. They decided to sit at the foot of a tree as there were many fireflies making light and dancing. They gazed at the moon and the fireflies and soon fell asleep. The night went by and in the morning they got up from their sleep. They saw a magnificent and beautiful butterfly. It was full of colors. They looked at each other and smiled with happiness. For a moment they forgot they were lost and hungry and followed the butterfly and tried to play with it. And within no time they reached towards a funny looking house. They were astonished to see the house was made of chocolates, candies, gems and cake. They had never seen such a house before. They were so happy and could not resist having those delicious sweets. This is like a drama land. When they were done, they saw the door of the house and decided to go inside expecting lot more to eat and play. As they go inside, the door slams and they see a beautiful lady cooking supper. They greet her with happiness as she looks so kind and generous. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, my dear lady. lady. Hansel and Gretel say to her, we have lost our way back home. Would you be kind enough to help us find our way back? The lady looks at them with enough kindness and nods her head. Yes, of course, my children. I shall surely help you. But be my guest and stay with me for a few days. I stay alone and would like to enjoy your company. The children were really happy. She cooked delicious food for them and served them with whatever they could think of. You both are very lean and slim. I'll feed you and make you healthy. She said smiling. A few days passed and one night Gretel got up of her sleep at midnight. As she got up, she heard of some whisper. She started walking towards the sound and saw that the beautiful lady was actually a cruel witch who was planning and plotting to kill the children and eat them up. She was serving them delicious food to make them healthy so that she could relish the meal. The witch did not know that Gretel had seen her and Gretel was shivering to the core of her heart. Next morning, when the children woke up, they found that things were different. There was no food on the table and no delicacies for them to have. Gretel had still not told Hansel of what she saw last night. And as she decides to tell him, the lady who was actually a witch came and with enough love told the children that there was not enough food in the house to cook and so she could not cook any meal for them. Lady asked Hansel, Dear son, would you please get me some wood from the nearby forest? so that I can cook a meal for all of us. Meanwhile, me and Gretel will do the preparations. Hansel agreed quickly. She handed him an axe and he left the house happily. Gretel knew something was not right and was very scared, but she kept on doing what the lady told her so as not to alarm her. As Hansel was going towards the forest, he saw 
at the back of the house there were piles of logs stacked he was a clever boy and at once he felt that something was wrong he tried to peep into the window and suddenly saw the actual witch who had by now shown her actual self to gretel hansel did not make any noise and was very careful that the witch may not feel his presence hansel was planning fast as what can be done and how he can protect his dear sister meanwhile he heard the cruel witch telling gretel go to the kitchen and start the oven gretel had no choice than to do what witch told her some time later the witch told gretel go and check if the oven was properly lit gretel told the witch i don't know how to check can you show me how to check it so that i can do it later the witch felt how stupid gretel was come on girl i'll show you she said hansel who was observing everything from outside thought this was his only chance as the witch started to walk towards the oven he came from behind stealthily and as the witch bent down to check in the oven hansel ran towards her and pushed her in the oven and gretel efficiently and quickly closed the oven door and locked it the evil bitch burned into a crisp hansel and gretel hugged each other they both could not believe what happened and that they were safe now they went to the witch's room and were surprised to see how much wealth and precious gems she owned they filled all they could in their bag and left the house quickly and ran till they eventually reached their house they saw their father sitting out in the porch he looked so miserable and sad they quickly ran towards him and they all kissed and hugged each other children told father all they had experienced father was really angry and told his nagging wife to leave them alone as she goes the children show the gems and wealth they collected from the evil witch's treasure finally they could live a carefree life and lived together happily goldilocks and the three bears once there was a pretty little girl who was called goldilocks because her head was covered in golden curls she liked to walk by herself in the woods and when she was hungry she would eat the wild strawberries there and when she was tired she would sleep on the dry moss three bears lived in the woods father bear who was big and had a deep voice and mother bear who was smaller and rounder and had a middling deep voice and a baby bear who was like a ball of fur and had a squeaky voice because they were all such different sizes each of them had his own chair own bed and own porridge bowl every evening mother bear used to put the porridge to soak in the saucepan on the oven and every morning she boiled it up and poured it into the three bowls for the bears breakfast on the morning that this story happened the sun was shining in the window and the birds were singing outside and father bear and baby bear were splashing around in the stream behind the house having their morning wash mother bear called to them that breakfast was ready and then they sat down in front of their bowls of steaming hot porridge oh my porridge is too hot exclaimed the father bear in his deep gruff voice oh my porridge is too hot the mother bear said in a softer voice oh my porridge is too hot the baby bear said in his squeaky voice so they all decided to go out for a walk until their porridge had cooled down no sooner had they left their cottage than goldilocks came along 
She was hungry and tired because she had been walking for a long time and she decided to stop for a while at this strange little cottage. She looked in through the window and saw a well scrubbed wooden table with three bowls of porridge laid out on it and around it three chairs to sit on. Is anybody home? She called out but nobody answered her. The bears had left the door ajar. So Goldilocks walked through the door into the bears living room. Since there was no one there, she sat down in father bear's chair to rest. But it was too big for her and her feet could not even reach the ground. So she climbed on onto the mother bear's chair and wriggled around it to get comfortable. In the end, she decided that it was too big for her too. And so she hopped off and sat down in baby bear's chair, which broke because it was too small. Goldilocks walked around the table again and the smell of porridge made her hungry. She dipped a spoon into father bear's bowl, but the porridge in it was too hot, so she dropped it again. Then she tried some from the mother bear's bowl, but that was too cold. The porridge in the baby bear's bowl was just right and Goldilocks ate it all up. By now, she was very sleepy and when she caught sight of a large bed in the next room, she decided that she would have a short rest before returning home. So she climbed up into the father bear's bed, but when she lay down on it, it was so big that she felt quite uncomfortable. So she climbed off it quickly and went to lie in the mother bear's bed. But that one was so soft that she still felt quite uncomfortable. So she scrambled out of it again quickly. Then she tried baby bear's bed which was so comfortable that she immediately fell into fast sleep. Soon afterwards the three bears returned. Somebody has been eating my porridge. Father bear thundered when he saw the wooden spoon in it. Somebody's been eating my porridge. The mother bear cried when she saw her bowl. Somebody's been eating my porridge and has finished it all up. The baby bear wailed and burst into tears. Then father bear said, Somebody has been sitting in my chair. And then the mother bear said, Somebody's been sitting in my chair too. And the baby bear squeaked. Somebody's been sitting in my chair and has broken it all to pieces. <laughs> then the three bears began to look around for what else they could find. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed. The father bear growled. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed too, said the mother bear. Somebody's been sleeping in my bed and here she's right now. The baby bear cried. At that, Goldilocks woke up and opened her eyes. When she saw the three bears looking down at her, she got such a fright that she jumped off the bed and ran out of the house as fast as she could. She ran all the way home and never went into the woods again. Jack and the Beanstalk Once upon a time, there was a poor woman who lived in a humble cottage in the countryside with her only son, whose name was Jack. They owned a cow that gave more milk than any other cow in the neighborhood. And they made butter and cheese with the extra milk and sold it at the market nearby. But one day, the cow went dry and there was no milk to make butter and cheese. There was not even a milk for them to drink. They ate less every day. But before long, they had almost nothing left to eat and no money to buy food. Jack was still too young to work and his mother had fallen ill. Jack's mother called him to her bedside. I am too weak. Go out myself, Jack. 
So you must take the cow to the market and sell there for as much money as you can. Yes, mother. Jack liked going to market, but he was sad that they would have to sell the cow. He set out walking slowly and had gone about half the way when an old man stopped him. Do you want to sell that cow? I will buy her from you in exchange of this magic beans. The beans, which were all different colors, were very beautiful. And the old man had said they were magic. So Jack gave him the cow and ran home with the beans. Look, mother, what I have got! He cried as he hurried into her room. But his mother was furious when she saw that he had come home without any money for the cow. What? You've sold our good cow for these worthless beans? And she threw them out of the window. That evening, Jack and his mother ate their last crust of bread and went to bed very sadly, for they knew that there was nothing left for breakfast. Jack woke up early next morning, still hungry. He was so hungry, in fact, that he jumped out of bed and went into the garden to look for something to eat. To his amazement, he saw that the magic beans had grown into a huge plant that stretched right up over the roof and disappeared into the sky. The stems of the plant were so thickly twisted that he could climb up them as if they were the rungs of a ladder. He began to pull himself up higher and higher and higher. At last, he reached the top of the beanstalk. In front of him was a white road which led to a great castle far in the distance. There was no one to be seen, so he started to walk along the road. Maybe someone at the castle would give him something to eat. In any case, it would certainly be an adventure. He was hot and tired and hungrier than ever by the time he reached the castle. Its great gate was shut, but Jack knocked on it loudly. After a while, it was opened by a huge ugly old woman who had only one eye in the middle of her forehead. Oh, she cried, I need a boy just like you to clean out the furs for me every day. Come in quickly, come in and hide or my husband will see you and eat you up. Frightened, Jack hurried inside at once and told the giantess he would become her servant in exchange for something to eat. She gave him a piece of bread and a glass of buttermilk. But while he was drinking it, in the castle, walls began to shake with a heavy tread, and Jack could hear the giant coming closer. Quick, quick, hide behind the cupboard, whispered the giantess, and Jack slipped out of sight as the giant stamped into the room shouting. <laughs> I smell the blood of an Englishman, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, be he alive or be he dead. I'll grind his bones to make my bread, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Fee, fee, fo, fo. Nonsense! It's only a nice young elephant that I cooked for your breakfast. Sit down and eat it while it's hot. So the giant sat down, ate his breakfast, and forgot all about the Englishman who stood watching him from behind the cupboard. When he had finished, he called out, Wife, mm. bring me my magic hen. I want to see some new golden eggs. <laughs> Jack could hardly believe his eyes when he saw what happened next. The giantess brought in a little brown hen and put it on the table in front of her husband. Hey, you, lay. Lay! The giant commanded and plop, plop, plop. She immediately led one, two and three golden eggs. 
the giant scooped the eggs into his pocket. Then he settled back in a chair and soon was snoring so loudly that the castle walls shook with the noise. Chad crept out from behind the curtain, snatched up the magic cane, and ran out of the castle as fast as his legs would carry him. With the hen tucked under his arm, he climbed quickly down the beanstalk and hurried into the cottage up to his mother's room. She was very happy to see him again. She cried with joy and then she cried some more because now they would have as many golden eggs as they wanted and never be poor again. But Jack soon began to long for another adventure. So one morning, he set out again up the beanstalk, higher, 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 until he reached the top. This time, he has dyed his hair black, and the giantess did not recognize him. Ha! Oh, you are just the boy to help me clean out the chicken. Run and chase the mice away. Hurry inside. For my husband sees you, he will show you. Once upon a time, very long ago, an old couple lived in a village far away in a little cottage. The old woman was very fond of cooking and making special treats every day. One day, she read in her recipe book how to bake a gingerbread. She decided to make one. To enhance her treat, she made a figure out from the dough. Figure of a boy. She made two eyes on it with vanilla cream and lips with strawberry cream. She also dressed it with different colors and called it gingerbread boy. She then put the gingerbread boy into the oven to bake it. It was only after few minutes when she heard voices coming from the oven. Let me out! Please let me out! It's too hot in here! Please let me out! Someone seemed to be saying. Who could it be? She thought and opened the oven door. As soon as she opened the door of the oven, Gingerbread Boy jumped out and started running. The old couple could not believe on their eyes. Before they could realize anything, the Gingerbread Boy reached the road outside. They too ran behind the Gingerbread Boy. Both of them shouted, Stop, little gingerbread boy! We want to eat you! Stop! They were panting as they ran. They ran a little while but could not catch him. He was too fast for them. The gingerbread boy had gone only a little distance when he crossed the cow in the farm. The cow called for him. Stop, little boy! Stop! You look so delicious! I want to eat you! But the gingerbread boy didn't give a heed. He did not stop running. He saw a cow running after him. The cow tried hard but could not catch him. He was too fast for the cow too. The gingerbread boy had not gone very far when he met a horse. I am very hungry and you look so yummy. I must eat you. Stop! Said the horse running after the gingerbread boy. When gingerbread boy saw the horse running behind him, he started running faster. The horse did not want the gingerbread boy to run away. On the other hand, gingerbread boy ran as fast as he could to be escaped. No doubt the gingerbread boy had escaped the attack of an old couple and the cow successfully. He was sure to escape the horse's attack too. It was the question of his life. So he ran faster than the hungry horse. Soon he ran out of the reach of the horse too. The little gingerbread boy was sure that nobody could catch him now. As he was running through the forest, a sly old fox saw him. The gingerbread boy would make a good supper. The fox thought and called. Hey little boy, stop! I want to talk to you! But the gingerbread boy knew what the cunning fox was up to. So he did not stop and continued running. 
The fox too gave in a hot chase. Not bothered, the ginger boy sang as he ran. He was too fast for the fox too. But the fox did not give up. He too continued his chase of gingerbread boy with a watering mouth. He had already decided to catch and eat gingerbread boy by hook or crook. Soon the gingerbread boy reached the river bank. He did not know how to swim. Moreover, he was afraid that if he goes into the water, he would get dissolved and die. He found himself in a fix. What should I do now? He said to himself as he stood on the rock on the bank of the river. Meanwhile, Fox to reach the river bank and decided to take advantage of the problem. The fox went up to the gingerbread boy and said, "Don't worry, I'll take you across the river. You just jump on my tail. I know how to swim." The fox told the gingerbread boy very innocently. The gingerbread boy now believed every word of the clever fox. He jumped on to his tail. Midway in the river, the fox said, "I cannot hold you on my tail." You would be safer if you come on to my back. The gingerbread boy had no choice. He did as the fox told him to do. He knew fox was planning something ugly in his mind, but he did not let the fox know about his suspicion. You are too heavy for my back too. The fox told him after he swam a little more distance. Why don't you jump on to my head? Why not? Whatever you say. And the gingerbread boy jumped on to fox's head being very cautious. After some time the fox again said, "It would be easier for me to carry you on my nose. We would soon be on the other side of the river. Then you would be free to go wherever you want to go." As soon as the fox reached the other end of the river, he tossed the gingerbread boy high up, and the fox was ready with an open mouth and closed eyes to gobble him up in no time. But nothing came down. When he opened his eyes, he saw gingerbread boy on the tree above saying, "Better luck next time, you cunning sly old fox. This time, eat the dust!" Ha 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 ha.